What's up, you beautiful bastards? Hope you have had a fantastic Thursday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing I want to talk about, let's start off light. Let's talk about a tech story I want to talk about for two reasons. The first reason is that there's a little bit of misinformation out there about it, and the second being it has my favorite headline I've read in the past 24 hours, and that comes from Fox News, who wrote, Your iPhone has been secretly looking at your boobs. And the thing is, that headline's not not true. This all seems to have gotten massive attention thanks to one Twitter user who noticed something in her iPhone. She wrote, Attention all girls. Go to your photos and type in the brazier. Why are Apple saving these and made it a folder? And women from all over started doing this and then they found pretty much the same result. Even Chrissy Teigen joining in on this investigation, sharing her results with the caption, it's true. If you type in brazier in the search of your iPhotos, it has a category for every boob or cleavage pic you've ever taken. Why? Some other users saying they feel violated. But here's the thing, Apple's not saving those photos to a specific folder and throwing that out to the iCloud. What we're seeing here is essentially tagging. Back in mid-2016, Apple's Photos app started using image recognition, but most people knew it as face recognition. You know, it's a pretty handy feature. You have a year, several years of photos on your phone. The, the app just goes through it and it says, hey, here's every picture of your buddy, Greg. Here's every picture of Jessica. Pretty cool, but what a lot of people didn't realize is it was tagging more than just faces. Reportedly, there are thousands of things that the phone can identify. Various animals, food, inanimate objects, and as it turns out, your breasts. And while there is no category for naked or nude, there is for bra, brassiere. So you know, the next time a Chrissy Teigen wants to send a, a top-focused picture to John Legend, boom. No reason to scroll through thousands of photos, just hit that search bar. Also, this isn't even an exclusively Apple thing. Google Photos does this. I type in kid, pretty much every picture I've ever taken of Trey pops up. I type in bra, this old glamour shot I took of Jessica Negri pops up. So I guess, yes, the main point of this is uh, technology does care and does look at your breasts, but just for you in case you wanna go back and find them for a rainy day. Then, in a quickie update, if you watched yesterday's show, you know and have a certain probably strong feelings about Brianna Brochu. Well, the news is coming out now is that in addition to her criminal charges, she is also no longer a student at the University of Hartford. The University of Hartford issuing a statement yesterday where they said, as of this morning, Brianna Brochu is no longer a student at the University of Hartford. She will not be returning to the institution. Now the question kind of becomes, where can you land after something like this? And there was also big news on the criminal front. Yesterday, the West Hartford police announced that they were going to seek an additional charge. And that being the charge of intimidation based on bigotry or bias, which is actually a felony hate crime charge. And so personally, I think this is all fantastic news. It seems like Brianna might might actually be held accountable. But I am still left with a question, if this story didn't blow up on social media, would it have been swept under the rug, or was this going to be handled anyway? As outsiders, I don't think we'll ever really know, but uh, I think we all have our own opinions there. But from there, I wanna share some stuff I love today, and today in Awesome, brought to you by Postmates. I was a fan of the app before, now that I am a father of two, it is vital to my sanity in life. And most awesome of all, if you are a new customer, you have a new account, click the link in the description, download the app, and when you're in the app, use promo code PhillyD, and they will give you $100 in free delivery credits. That way, you try it out, if you love it, you keep using it, if not, well, your life became a little more convenient for a little while. The first bit of awesome, hands down, winner today. Disney unveiling the cast for the live action Lion King and oh my God. So many people just went from that stupid to yes please, I'm buying my ticket now. Donald Glover as Simba, Beyonce as Nala. We could just stop there and it's a win, but they don't. You got James Earl Jones as Mufasa. Chiwetel Ejiofor as Scar. Florence Kasumba as Shenzi. Kegel Mike and Key as Kamari. Eric Andre as Azizi. John Oliver as Zazu. Billy Eichner and Seth Rogen as Timon and Pumbaa. I mean, this is just an automatic yes for me. Then we got a brand new trailer for The Disaster Artist, which, oh my God, I'm so pumped for. Then we got a new teaser for The Star Wars The Last Jedi. Then an awesome from a fellow crypto enthusiast out there, Bitcoin went over $7,000 today. That said, while recording today, it's been bouncing all over the place, so who knows where it'll land. All I know is it's been a fantastic week. And if you wanna see the full versions of everything, I just share the secret link of the day, anything at all. Links, as always, are in the description down below. And then let's talk about Papa John's, the pizza company, because I don't know if you've seen this story, but the CEO is reportedly blaming the NFL for their low third quarter earnings. It is a bold, interesting claim. No matter what, it's most likely going to hurt the NFL, but let, let's talk about it. Reportedly, the company's founder and CEO, John Shatner, and the company's chief operating officer, Steve Ritchie, were on a conference call with investors where they said the NFL was the primary reason for the decline and that they, quote, expect it to persist unless a solution is put in place. Shatner also saying, the NFL has hurt us by not resolving the current debacle to the players and owners' satisfaction. This should have been nipped in the bud a year and a half ago. Like many sponsors, we are in contact with the NFL, and once the issue 
issue is resolved between the players and the owners, we are optimistic that the NFL's best years are ahead. But good or bad, leadership starts at the top, and this is an example of poor leadership. You need to look exactly at how the ratings are going backwards. Last year, the ratings for the NFL went backwards because of the election. This year, the ratings are going backwards because of the controversy, and so the controversy is polarizing the customer, polarizing the country. And after these quotes came out, there are many people saying this is a really bold claim. Is it really true? Some people pointed to Shatner's note of lower viewership, pointing out that he acknowledges that the NFL viewership dropped last year. But during that same time, Papa John sales actually grew. That said, I think to some effect, you could argue that it's, it's a different reason for lower viewership. There's an I'm interested in something else drop in viewership and uh, I hate your product viewership. But also you had other key sponsors saying that they have been unaffected by this. Last week, you had executives at Buffalo Wild Wings saying last week the company didn't expect declining NFL viewership to hurt a key sales figure. The department store Kohl's said it was working with the NFL on a holiday ad campaign. Pizza Hut executives said its sales have not been affected at all. But also, once again, to be fair, they haven't had the same level of partnership as Papa John's and the NFL has had. Another thing we also saw come out of this were a lot of people saying, well, maybe Papa John's sales is going down because your pizza's garbage. There's a lot of that. There were also people pointing out that John Shatner was a big Trump supporter, a big Trump donator, saying this could be personal. But honestly, from those quotes, it feels like this is just business. And ultimately, I end up thinking, yeah, could your sales be going down somewhat because you have a huge deal with the NFL and they have lower viewership? Sure. But I also think that Papa John's might be suffering because of innovation. I mean, the restaurant and food delivery service has been disrupted by, I mean, even companies like our sponsor today, Postmates. I mean, I feel like Domino's has really tried to stay ahead of the curve here with, with, with apps and how you can order their pizzas. But in general, people's options for deliveries have increased 50-fold. I mean, even if we just focus on pizza, people are no longer limited to just the main franchises, your, your Domino's, your, your Pizza Hut, your Papa John. If you're using a Postmates or even one of their competitors, you can go, oh my God, you know that one like hole-in-the-wall pizza place that I love? Boom, someone can deliver that for me. But I also can't completely shit all over what John Shatner said here. He was on a phone call with investors trying to let them know this is why. Trying to make investors think, okay, this little box, this is the problem. We're going to address this problem and things are looking up. That's way less scary than, Honestly, we don't know why we're making less money, but uh, maybe stuff will change soon. Because ultimately this boils down to money and Papa John's, like every other company, is just trying to keep their money safe and make more. And then let's talk about developments around the Manhattan terror attack. We talked about it yesterday. Eight people were killed, 12 were injured. Yesterday, the suspect appeared in court on charges of providing material support for ISIS, as well as violence and destruction of motor vehicles. Now from the court papers, we learned that he waived his Miranda rights and spoke to the officers in the hospital. He said he began planning the attack a year ago and decided on using a truck two months ago, saying he was inspired by ISIS posts online Line, specifically referencing when the leader of ISIS asked what Muslims in the U.S. and elsewhere were going to do to respond to the killing of Muslims in Iraq. We learned on October 22nd, he rented a truck from Home Depot to practice making turns. He said the original plan had been to continue driving across the Brooklyn Bridge, saying he wanted to hang ISIS flags on the car, but thought that that would draw too much attention. We learned there was a bag of knives in the truck, but he did not grab any before exiting the vehicle. During the interview with authorities, he said that he felt good about what he had done and even requested to hang an ISIS flag in the hospital room. From the report, we learned that they collected two cell phones from the crashed vehicle and on them, they found 3,800 images of ISIS propaganda. There were also approximately 90 videos, including ones that showed ISIS killing people, instructions on how to make explosives. They found internet searches for truck rentals, the Home Depot he would rent the vehicle from, and Halloween in New York City. And at this piece of garbage's appearance in court yesterday, there was no plea entered. The suspect has been transferred from the hospital to jail. As far as what happens next, well, President Trump went to Twitter to say what he thinks should happen, saying New York City terrorist was happy as he asked to hang ISIS flag in his hospital room. He killed eight people, badly injured 12, should get death penalty. Penalty. Would love to send the New York City terrorist to Guantanamo, but statistically that process takes much longer than going through the federal system. There's also something appropriate about keeping him in the home of the horrible crime he committed. Should move fast, death penalty. Additionally, Attorney General Jeff Sessions later said, Terrorists should know this. This administration will use all lawful tools at our disposal, including prosecution in Article Three courts, the federal court system, or at Guantanamo Bay. If anyone has any doubt about it, they can ask the more than 500 criminals whom the Department of Justice has convicted of terrorism-related offenses since 9-11. They can ask the dozens of enemy combatants in Guantanamo Bay. Now that said, here's what we know in regards to all of this. That we know of, no one that has been arrested in the United States has actually ever been sent to Guantanamo Bay. If he's found guilty of the murders in federal court, the death penalty could be on the table. And of his current charges, the material support of a terrorist group charge carries a maximum sentence of life in prison. Also, there's been a lot of concern over the fact that the president is tweeting about this. He's tweeting about a criminal case and that could complicate things. Those tweets could be seen as impacting the jury pool, which would impede the process. There are experts saying that the president's comments because it's coming from the president, because he has such a big reach that this could actually taint the jury. Or at the very least, a defense attorney could successfully argue that it did. And so that's where we are. Ultimately, where I land on this, in, in regards to the Trump tweets, I wish he didn't tweet it. But I also find myself agreeing that this, this terrorist scumbag deserves the death penalty. This garbage human being killed so many innocents and is not deserving of the air he's getting to breathe. But of course, that's just my personal takeaway from this, and I'd love to know what you think in those comments down below. And then let's talk about the Donna 
Brazil news. If you don't know, Donna Brazil was a prominent figure in the Democratic Party. She rode to prominence in 2000, working with the Gore campaign. She became an officer for the party. And in 2016, after the sack of Debbie Wasserman Schultz, she became the interim head of the Democratic Party. She's also, and this is why she's in the news, has an upcoming book titled Hacks. And she released a piece of it to Politico, and there has been a big reaction from it. Now, before we jump into that, you need a little context. We jump back to September 2016. Brazil had been interim head for a few months and been leading an investigation into the runnings of the party. At the time, Bernie Sanders had been defeated in a hotly contested primary by Hillary Clinton. You may remember for months, Bernie's team had been complaining that the whole thing was likely rigged. In April of 2016, they had issued a letter to the former head of the Democratic Party, Wasserman Schultz. They were complaining that the funding for the party was really a Clinton fund. And without getting into a huge list of numbers, here's what they were accusing the DNC of. The Hillary Victory Fund was a joint fund by the DNC and Hillary for America, HFA. It was essentially money that was supposed to help all Democratic candidates win. But Bernie's team accused the Victory Fund of essentially being a front, saying that the millions of dollars provided went straight to ads for the HFA rather than for all the groups the DNC was supposed to be supporting. And they accused the Victory Fund of being a way for large donors to circumvent the $2,700 limit for a single candidate donation. Essentially, you can contribute unlimited funds to a party's fund, but you are limited when it comes to a single candidate. So essentially, the accusation here is that there was a workaround that the unlimited fund was being used for a single person, or mostly for a single person. So that said, let's jump to Brazil's piece. In it, she's recounting the lead up to the September 7th phone call to Bernie Sanders. And this is after he's been defeated in the primaries. This is after Wasserman Schultz has been sacked by the DNC. Brazil had already been appointed interim chair of the Democratic Party back in July. And she writes, The Saturday morning after the convention in July, I called Gary Gensler, the chief financial officer of Hillary's campaign. He wasted no words. He told me the Democratic Party was broke and $2 million in debt. What? I screamed. I'm an officer of the party and they've been telling us everything is fine and they were raising money with no problems. And so according to Brazil, Wasserman Schultz had been lying about the books to officers in the party. The allegation being that they were relying on the Clinton campaign to pay that debt. Also claiming much of the debt being from Barack Obama not caring about the party after becoming president. He apparently left the party with well over $20 million in debt. Also, she says it didn't help that Wasserman Schultz kept a massive staff in between elections. That time is normally when parties release huge amounts of staff to save costs. But Wasserman Schultz was reportedly spending nearly $4 million per month on costs. And that was at a time when the party would normally spend less than half of that. Brazil's piece then moves on to the Clinton campaign, funneling money from the Hillary Victory Fund to the HFA via the DNC. And once again, that was a fund that was supposed to be for state Democratic candidates and for whoever would eventually become candidate. And they say Hillary's campaign managed to squeeze about $20 million to themselves from the fund. And that appears to have later been backed up by leaked emails from WikiLeaks. And in fact, it looked like the state parties were getting less than 0.5% of the 83 million raised for them, while the rest went to the Central Party and then the HFA. Brazil then claims she wanted to get to the bottom of why the Clinton's campaign seemed to have so much control. She points out the party normally has its own officers and apparatus, and once a candidate is chosen, they usually start appointing their own people into position. And she said when she asked the party's other officers and lawyers what's going on, they would shuffle their feet. Then came July, and when she said she made a discovery, writing, when I got back from a vacation in Martha's Vineyard, I at last found the document that described it all. The joint fundraising agreement between the DNC, the Hillary Victory Fund, and Hillary for America. The agreement signed by Amy Dacey, the former CEO of the DNC, and Robbie Mook, with a copy to Mark Elias, specified that in exchange for raising money and investing in the DNC, Hillary would control the party's finances, strategy, and all the money raised. Her campaign would have the right of refusal of who would be the party communications director, and it would make final decisions on all the other staff. The DNC also was required to consult with the campaign about all other staffing, budgeting, data, analytics, and mailings. But here's the thing, the agreement was reportedly signed August of 2015. So that is 11 months of Clinton being the candidate over the party without actually being the official candidate yet. So not only does this appear to be even more confirmation that the deck was just stacked against Bernie Sanders, and it also appears that this could have been a contributing factor to why the down the ticket Democratic candidates did so horribly. They were starving for money and essentially having their funds laundered through the HFA. Brazil pointing out, the funding arrangement with the HFA and the Victory Fund agreement was not illegal, but it sure looked unethical. If the fight had been fair, one campaign would not have control of the party before the voters had decided which one they wanted to lead. This was not a criminal act, but as I saw it, it compromised the party's integrity. She then says she called Bernie on September 7th like she promised. She said that he took the news stoically. She says he asked the chances of a Clinton victory. She said, I had to be frank with him. I did not trust the polls, I said. I told him I had visited states around the country and I found a lack of enthusiasm for her everywhere. I was concerned about the Obama coalition and about millennials. Now that said, some writers have begun pointing out that some of this seems to be a revisionist history. While Brazil wasn't a product of the Clinton machine, she definitely seemed to be in the Clinton camp. Brazil's portrayal here was that she was discovering that the party was Clinton's party. But hacked DNC emails show that she was passing off Democratic primary debate questions to the Clinton camp. These obtained through her position as a CNN political analyst. Also, it's been pointed out that it shouldn't have been a huge shock that the party preferred Clinton. The Clintons over the years have given huge sums to the party and her main opponent was an independent. So that's why you have people speaking up saying, well, is this just Brazil's attempt to separate herself from the failure? Separating herself from what she's now calling unethical? Even though the emails and the questions prior to the debate, that seems to make her somewhat complicit. And personally, where I land on this is I only believe so much of what Brazil is saying here. Once again, there's a story and there's now my takeaway
away my feelings on it. It feels like this whole piece was meant to absolve her of any wrongdoing, paint herself as an innocent bystander. But based off of stuff that WikiLeaks has released, it doesn't appear that she was innocent. And it's hard to doubt WikiLeaks' credibility here, especially since some of the other stuff that she talks about in this piece had already been released by WikiLeaks. And ultimately what this appears to be is, is more confirmation, not only that, that the Clintons had so much control and Bernie really, really got screwed, but confirmation that today we have a President Trump and large due to Hillary Clinton. Not only because of what she represented as a candidate and where she flew to or didn't fly to, but what she did to the DNC. And this isn't just about the past or going after Hillary Clinton. I mean, if you're looking at the future of the Democratic Party, I mean, the next presidential election is a little bit away, but if, if you are the DNC, how do you gain the trust back from someone who voted for Bernie Sanders? I mean, what can you possibly do? There can only be so many sacrificial lambs and still people are gonna think that it, it's the whole system, the whole thing rigged against them. I don't know, but that's where I'm gonna leave it today. Of course, this is the Philip DeFranco Show. It's not just me talking about the news, giving my opinion. I wanna hear from you, whether it be this last story, the first one, anything in between. Let me know in those comments down below. And remember, if you like this video, you like what I try and do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Make sure you don't miss these daily videos, which actually, if you did miss yesterday's Philip DeFranco Show, you wanna catch up, click or tap right there to watch that. Or if you need something lighter, you wanna watch the newest behind the scenes vlog, click or tap right there to watch that. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you next time.